we asked our mother if she thought or knew that our father had cheated on her when they were married. And then we, after we asked the question, we said together, we don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We really did. This is Caregiver Storyteller, produced by Caring Kind, the heart of Alzheimer's caregiving. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Caregiver Storyteller, a storytelling podcast about Alzheimer's and dementia caregiving. I'm Chris Doucette, and I'll be interviewing caregivers to get their stories about Alzheimer's and dementia caregiving. Occasionally, I'll also interview the authors, advocates, researchers, healthcare professionals, and people with Alzheimer's and dementia to hear their stories, too. So, are you ready? Here we go. Okay. My name is Ellen Lebowitz. I live in New Jersey, northern New Jersey at the moment, and um, my, my relationship to Alzheimer's is my mother has it. She currently has Alzheimer's. Yeah, she's actually had it now. For, she's, I think she's had it for probably 10 years, but she's been living in a nursing home with um, what I call stage 17 Alzheimer's for five years. She lived in assisted living for three years before that, after my father died. I see her at least at least twice a week. It's just devastating. How did that come about? What was your relationship to your mom before her diagnosis? And and what was the moment when you realized something was amiss? I realized something was amiss when she was in assisted living because um, I was, I saw her almost every day when she was there. I went through all the early stages of it with her. She had a, an excellent doctor who told me that because he had taken care of my father when he was sick, and I was my father's caregiver in hospice. Um, and really quickly, how was your? did your father also have Alzheimer's or no, dementia? No, he oh, had okay. congestive heart failure. Okay. When she was in assisted living, she went through, I discovered what is known as sundowning. So I saw all that, and she lived in an apartment in assisted living with a full-time living home health aide. Mm -hmm. People that are close to me, my sister, I think she didn't want to deal with the fact that maybe my mother did have Alzheimer's. Anyway, the I went through the sundowning thing with my mother, and her doctor kept telling me it was sundowning. And can you, for our listeners who might not be familiar with what sundowning is, can you do a, a brief description of what sundowning there, is? The person's internal clock totally changes. So they're up all night, they're wandering around, um, they don't sleep during the day, they, their um, personality starts to change a lot. And my mother actually was basically a very kind of judgmental person, very superficial is what I'm trying to say. And the Alzheimer's, you know, as someone said to me once, meet your new mother. She's the, her personality has changed so that I, it's like I forgive her for every horrible thing she ever did in the past. And there were many, many things, okay? Now she just gets my unconditional love and understanding. And um, because nobody, I don't think unless you are around somebody with Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone understands what Alzheimer's does to a person. Mm -hmm. If someone told me, this is what Alzheimer's is, this is how people behave when they have it, I would think they were either drama queens or um, fabricating something. I mean, it's unbelievable. I have seen, when I say my mother is going through, there is no such thing, I know it's stage 17 of Alzheimer's, but it's the, the, the changes she's gone through that I've witnessed are still mind-blowing and staggering. Can you give me some examples of when, when you first noticed her examples of sundowning? What, what did you notice? Well, mostly I noticed that she wasn't sleeping. She was trying to leave her apartment and leave the building um, at, in the middle of the night. She actually called the police a few times from the assisted living facility, which turned out to be quite problematic. Uh -huh. She started getting very... Uh, not violent, but very difficult with, with the AIDS, the mm -hmm. home health AIDS. Most, we, we went through quite a few, mm -hmm. most of whom were um, actually cared about her, took very, very good care of her. She was just getting um, very difficult, very difficult. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was living 10 minutes away from her. And I was going there like morning, noon, and night, and I didn't, at the time, didn't understand what she was going through. 
And, and no one at the residential care facility had an idea or an inkling what she might be going through? No, they didn't. As a matter of fact, what happened there was um, they had an excellent nurse mm-hmm. who, for whatever, who was just superb. And for whatever reason, administration fired this excellent nurse. Anyway, they brought on this new nurse who was horrible. And any time I asked her a question about anything, she would tell me to take her to her doctor. So I was going bringing my mother to doctors mm. like every other day. So I did not think she was going insane or anything like that. I was, but I didn't think she was. Um, and, you know, her doctor, her internist said, told me what she was going through. And it got to a point where then she she didn't always, the dining room was downstairs. So she stopped. She didn't want to always go and eat downstairs in the dining room. So they had a policy there. If you didn't go downstairs for like two weeks, two, like 14 days in a row, you couldn't live there anymore. Mm. So we found the um, nursing home where she is now. Woman came in. They gave her... Um, she had been to a couple of neurologists, and they all did the sa- said the same thing. They gave her the same test that she had to leave, and we found this nursing home for her, which is actually quite good. And is it a is it a, a nursing home that specializes in Alzheimer's and dementia She's care? She's in the unit that does specialize in Alzheimer's, and she lives with other people who have, um, you know, all anyone who lives in her unit has Alzheimer's, mm-hmm. and I've seen all the different things it does to people, Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So after she had been in there for a while, at first she was acting, she was kind of okay. Then she was going through more stages of Alzheimer's. And I was very confused because unlike when I was literally taking care of my father, living with my father when he was in hospice with his congestive heart failure, there was a team, a hospice team. So the nurses with the hospice team explained every single thing that was going on with him. Mm-hmm. So I knew what to be prepared for. Mm. They don't, Alzheimer's, there's no preparation for Alzheimer's. No one can tell you what's going on. And um, so I was very confused. I had no idea. I, used, I, I started going to on the web Mayo Clinic, because they have a very good um, outline of what to expect, right. but it, it wasn't really helping. And is this and is this a period of time when she was at the former residential? No, no, no. This, she was now. She was now in the, the one the she's in home. right now. Yes. And you still feel like you weren't getting a lot of information about her dementia care. Not enough. Not, not enough. enough. Not enough right. for me because I have to know. Right. I have to understand, like the signs behind it, and I right. have to understand what to expect. But you don't know what. There's no chart. No one can say, okay, n- you know, in two weeks this is going to happen mm-hmm. with her. Um, so I started doing, as I usually do, a lot of research about mm-hmm. Alzheimer's, and I started researching all of the Alzheimer's organizations here in New York. And I started calling, I'm very big on calling people for information. So I did. And I spoke with and actually met with some people from various Alzheimer's organizations. Mm -hmm. And when I walked in to have meetings with these people, um, I have to say the environments were sterile, absolutely sterile in these places. Um, it was as if the people who worked there was as if, you know, they just found it, they needed a job and they found one in these places. Mm-hmm. I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't me. And then I, um, I was Googling Alzheimer's New York and I came upon Caring Kind. That's how I found ah. Caring Kind. And I went to your website and I saw that you were doing one of your lectures at the Times at the, the Times Time Center. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. It was the one with um, David Shank and David Hyde Pierce were on the panel. Mm-hmm. I went to it. 
And for those who might not know, the Time Center is an annual event that Karen Kind produces where uh, we bring in some experts in the field of Alzheimer's and dementia care. And it might be science focused, it might be behavior focused, it might be residential care focused, palliative care. And uh, it's, it's a big event and, uh, and, and a popular one among people who are stakeholders, really, and, and volunteers or donors of Karen Kind. And, uh, and so that's the event that you went to. Yes. Yeah. And I have to say, you know, I got there, got in line, the line went around the building. <laughs> and I burst into tears because I thought, oh, my God, all these people are here for the same reason I am. I stopped feeling alone. I felt I had felt so incredibly alone because I was confused and there was no one to, you know, there was no one to um, guide you through that yes. process, right? And yeah. I felt such relief. So then I, you know, I attended the event, I sat through the event. I thought it was spectacular. David Schenk is I think brilliant. David Hyde Pierce is brilliant. Um Llewellyn Barkin spoke, Jed Levine spoke. Mm-hmm. I thought, "Oh my god, you know, these people are Amazing. I felt the com- my comfort level shot right up. You know, I was just, um, to say I was impressed with the event would be an understatement. I felt, um, I just felt tremendous relief. And I went out and I, I, I bought David Schenk's book that mm-hmm. he had, um, I think it was called The Forgetting. The forgetting. That's yes, right. mm-hmm. brilliant book, full of research, interesting to read. He, I mean, he spoke about the book, but um, I read the book and I thought this is this is perfect. And I kept going. You know, I went to whatever events I could. You know, I could attend. Mm-hmm. The first time I ever worked, um, walked into the offices of Caring Kind, the vibe got me immediately. It was the people, the people who work at Caring Kind such as yourself, <laughs> are um, very unusual. They get it. They are there to help you. They are very knowledgeable. They've all been through Alzheimer's in one you know, f- shape or another. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they just, they care. They are smart. It's, you know, to me, it's an organization. I feel to a certain degree, I don't mean to be melodramatic about this, it saved my life. Well, you're like our biggest cheerleader. I had no idea. Yeah, I just, you know. (laughs) I should just mention to anyone listening that I did not expect Ellen to say all these wonderful things, and she's not being paid to say any of these compliments. So (laughs) I appreciate, and the staff very much appreciate your Well, you have a remarkable staff. It's people who really, really care, because when I've been here for various things, the staff I know, they see me, they say hi, Ellen, they give me a hug. I mean, they're just great people. day that the person, the admissions person from the nursing home came to assisted living to talk to my mother, to admit her, and told me, yes, she has Alzheimer's, I cried. Mm. Because I really, you know, it's, had I known what it was really going to be like, I would have cried more. But to hear your mother has Alzheimer's, is, it's very, it's, it's chilling. Yeah. You know, it's absolutely chilling. And what I've seen, she's actually been in this nursing home now for five years. I thought mm-hmm. it was four. It's five. Mm-hmm. And the changes I've seen her go through are mind-blowing. I, if someone had told me, she no longer, she doesn't understand words anymore. Mm-hmm. So she babbles. She mm-hmm. talks a lot, but it's all gibberish. I have mm-hmm. no idea what she's saying. Mm-hmm. I never ask her questions because mm-hmm. I think it's not good for her. She can't answer them. Mm-hmm. Every time she talks gibberish and she talks about God and machines all the time, I have no idea what that means. Mm-hmm. All I do in response to everything she says is I smile a lot and I say, mm-hmm. okay, Ma. That's that's my response to everything she says. Yeah. Okay, Ma. Yeah. You know, when it was for her birthday, I go there. She doesn't know what birthday means. Mm-hmm. And I tell her happy birthday. I, I write down how old she is. She doesn't. Uh, she has no idea what I'm talking about. Right. That's very hard. Do you find that the level of care that she has gotten at the at the on the dementia care unit is more specific to her needs? Yes. Is her sleeplessness and her kind of antisocial behavior or combativeness, has that reduced since yes. she's joined? So, yes. So they're, they have kind of an, an operation and a process by which oh, they are yes, sensitive to her. Oh, yes, where she is now. Yeah. You know, yeah. she's in a unit where everyone who works in that unit has been trained specifically 
you know, to right. work with Alzheimer's. Right. Yes, oh, okay. absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, one thing I did notice is I used to see her once a week, and now I've been going more because I decided that she needed to have more physical contact with somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, they talked to her there, of course, and she's surrounded, she lives with other people like her. But I decided that um, she needed, you know, human touch. She needed someone to touch her. Yeah. And what I also noticed some time ago is that if you go to touch her, like if I put my arm around her shoulder, she scre- she's terrified of being touched. Mm. And she screamed, the first time she screamed, stop that or I will kill you. She actually said those words. And then she follows it up. She starts kissing me like crazy. Mm-hmm. And the first time she did that, I was, um, I was, I don't even know what it was. I was thrown. I didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. I just stood there and looked at her and I just said, okay. And then she grabbed my hand and she started she 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 puckers up a lot because she wants to kiss me all the time, which is very odd because when I was growing up, she was not that affectionate. Uh-huh. So there's a sense of there's like, okay, Mom, if you, too bad you weren't like this my entire life, you yeah, know. I mean, yeah. you have to you have to look for the humor where you can find it. Yeah. Um, what was she like growing up? Let's see, slightly up from, towards me, um, she was slightly cold, very very concerned about appearances, mm-hmm. very concerned about that. Not very affectionate with me or really my sister, I guess. Not the best mother in the world, Mm -hmm. you know, but it doesn't matter anymore. Right. You know, I mean, because I thought to myself once when I thought, you know, you should see her more often. I wasn't seeing her once a week because I thought I felt obligated. I didn't feel there was no obligation there. But she has Alzheimer's, Mm -hmm. you know, there's no cure, they can't treat it. I don't know where this affection comes from that my mother has now. You know, if it was always there, but I mean, it probably wasn't always there. But she, she sometimes she takes my hand, she, she'll kiss it. She's very big on touching my face now, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or taking my hand and putting it on her face. That's why I go to visit her more often mm-hmm. because sometimes I think it's a good thing, as much as I miss my father, that he's not here because mm-hmm. this would kill him. He mm-hmm. loved her very much. What were they like as a couple growing up? Well, they clearly they clearly loved each other. Mm-hmm. They they did. Although I have to say, when I was taking care of my father, when he was in hospice, my mother refused to see him the last two months of his life. Mm. I don't know if that had anything to do with the Alzheimer's. I think she just my mother was couldn't manage. She couldn't handle things, and I can. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'm very good at. I think I'm just wired in a certain way. I'm mm-hmm. very good at dealing with certain awful things, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, am I a martyr? No. But I'll tell you, this Alzheimer's, it just, I have never seen anything like it. If someone had said to me, your mother, this is what, how your mother's going to be with Alzheimer's, I would right. have said, you're nuts. Yeah. I think, I, I believe that, I, I think my parents were very happily married. Mm-hmm. I think that... My mother being slightly on the selfish side, I think when my father got really, really sick and when he was put in hospice, I think in her mind that he was the one who was supposed to take care of her. Mm. It, she wasn't supposed to have to take care of him. When he was put in hospice, I remember her saying to me something. She threw up her hands basically and said, this is, I can't manage this. And I said to her, Mom, everything is manageable. I'll manage it. Unknown to me that, in fact, I was going to be managing it for eight months because when my father was put into hospice, his doctor said to me, don't go home yet, meaning back to New York so fast. He has about three weeks to live, and he lasted eight months. And the doctor thinks I I took very good care of him. I, of course, there was an entire hospice team. Right. But I thought watching my father die by myself, I thought that was going to be the worst thing that I could ever watch. This is different. Mm -hmm. This is different because, you know, a nurse told me when it became clear that my father was actually now dying, she explained every single thing that was going to happen, and it did. There's no one to explain what's going to happen with Alzheimer's. And there's no way to prepare yourself for it. And you have to just, you know, if I could say to people who are have someone that they're either taking care of or they love with Alzheimer's, you have to 
live in their world. Your world doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. It's their world. You know, if they say stuff that makes no sense, do not question them Mm -hmm. because they don't get it. And I think, I do believe, if you ask someone with Alzheimer's questions, they can answer them, but I think somewhere in there, they know that they can't answer a question. Right. So I tell people, don't ask them questions. And of course, some people do. They say, oh, Ellen, everybody deals with this their own way. You know, I don't think that's right. What's your mom's name? Her name is Ruth. Ruth. Mm -hmm. What was Ruth's response and reaction to her own diagnosis of Alzheimer's? She didn't know. She didn't know? No. She didn't know. When I got, I I took her to two neurologists. Um, I was told, do not tell mom she has Alzheimer's. So I told my mother, I said, you know, we're going to the memory doctor. Okay, that's fine. I never told her. And when she moved, when she was moved from the assisted living facility to the mm-hmm. nursing home, I, I don't think she realized she was moving. I don't. But when she got in there, she may have realized she was in a different place, but to what degree, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And the first few weeks she was there, I would see her and say, oh, mom, is it, don't you love your new hotel? This is, you know, you pick this hotel. She, so even now, if once in a blue moon, she, she'll say something about going home. I don't even think she understands what that means. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll say, oh, mom, but you live in this beautiful hotel that you picked. Mm-hmm. I don't think she, I don't think she, I do not believe my mother is aware that there's anything wrong with her, mm-hmm. which is good. Now, was that approach uh, a decision by you or did, do you and your sister share caregiving decision making? I see my mother once to twice a week. My mm-hmm. sister sees her much less because my sister, she travels a lot for her work. Mm-hmm. So her schedule is simply not her own at all. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my sister will tell me when she sees my mother, you know, I, I was around my sister once when she saw my mother, and she was asking my mother a lot of questions. And I told my sister I didn't think she should do that. I said she can't answer them. And she said... You know, you handle it your way, I'll, you, I'll handle it my way. So I handle it my way. Right. You know. It sounds like you had maybe a closer relationship with your father than your mother? Absolutely. Yeah? What yes. was he like growing up? My father, very, very loving, very, very sentimental. Mm-hmm. Um, as a matter of when I was taking care of him, he had certain procedures done in the house. He knew he was dying. He knew mm-hmm. that. And... At one point, I mean, I was like, because he was on a morphine drip for months and months, um, there were a couple things that I had to do for him that I couldn't do. I was afraid to hurt him. Um, And I remember one point he said to one of the aides, he said, oh, Ellen, she can do any job because he knew what I was doing. And at one point I did say to my father, I said, I have to call Pam. Pam was the hospice nurse mm-hmm. because there was something that needed to be done for my father. Mm-hmm. And I just, I was afraid I was going to hurt him. So I called her up and um, she was scheduled to come to the house at a certain time. And I said, could you come earlier? Because I, I'm afraid I'm going to kill him if I do this. Mm-hmm. And she came over. But um, I think when you're taking care of someone under circumstances that you never could have imagined. I mm-hmm. never would have imagined that my mother w- did not want to see my father, would not want to see him in his last, the last two months of his life. She had hurt her back, mm-hmm. so she was in a rehab facility. She stayed there for two months after she was, re- she wanted to be released, so she didn't want to see him. So she just lived at this very overpriced facility for uh-huh. two months. Uh-huh. When he was prescribed hospice by his doctor, he wanted to do it in the house, at home hospice, so Mm -hmm. he could be with his family. Right. Well, that family turned out to be me. My sister was unavailable because of her work. She had no choice. Mm -hmm. And my mother was elsewhere. Um, What was his name? Harold. And I did it. And, you know, to a certain degree, I may have overcompensated with my being on duty 24-7, but I think it was because my mother wasn't there, Mm -hmm. you know. Because you were the primary caregiver, it sounds like, mostly for both, did that lead to conflict with your sister? No, No? it didn't, because she she literally, without getting specific here, my sister was making a movie at the time, Mm -hmm. and she could not 
she had actually told the director that her father was very was seriously ill and dying. Could they do it another time? And his answer was, now or never. Right. Okay? So that was the end of that. And she would call. She was calling my father all the time. So she was a wreck, you know? Mm-hmm. So no, she knew, she knew what I did. She absolutely knew mm-hmm. what I did. Um, with my mother, you know, Alzheimer's is so different. Mm-hmm. If someone said to me, D- describe all the stages your mother's gone through, there have been many. If you read someplace what the stages of Alzheimer's are, my mother's mm-hmm. been through all those stages. Mm-hmm. The only stage she hasn't been through is where you choke to death because mm-hmm. um, you can't, you don't remember how to swallow anymore. Mm-hmm. That's the last step. She hasn't mm-hmm. gotten there yet. Mm-hmm. You know, I could say, do you have six days? And I'll tell you, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a lot. When I go to visit my mother, I never, ever know what it's going to be like, really. Right. I don't, you know, and I I do tell her my name a lot because I think she's forgot it. When I do say, Mom, my name is Ellen. Your name is Ruth. My name is Ellen. And she'll look at me and she'll say, I know that, mm-hmm. you know, which, mm-hmm. of course, she doesn't because when I used to walk into where she is now, everyone's in a, it's, they were all in one large room and then there were smaller rooms around. Um, she used to yell, start yelling, Ellen, Ellen. She started waving when she saw me. Yeah. Now she just she, she calls me ma'am when she sees me. Ma'am. Ma'am. Uh-huh. ma'am. You know, I know Not she, miss, but ma'am. Ma'am, <laughs> yes. Well, she calls people because she doesn't remember names. She calls everybody there either sir or ma'am. Uh-huh. You, could, you could sit there. She calls my uncle sir. Mm-hmm. And when he, walks, when he comes to see her, um, he always says, you know, he gives her a kiss and he says, I'm Ralph. Do you have a favorite memory growing up with your mom and your dad, for that matter, and your sister? Any family member yes. kind of that stands out? Yes. Every Thanksgiving, because it was the only, it was a holiday where um, it was my grandparents, all my cousins, I have a lot of cousins, mm-hmm. and it was a blast. I loved it. Mm-hmm. My father, he died eight years ago, a week mm-hmm. before Thanksgiving. And for me now, I don't like any holidays. Mm -hmm. I just don't. I loved it. It was fun because I happen to be Jewish. So all the other holidays were sprinkled with, you know, rituals. Right. Passover is 18 hours with the Seder, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, I loved Thanksgiving. It was a, a tremendous amount of fun. I don't like it anymore. Was your father aware that your mom didn't want to see him the last two months? I don't know. I think he was aware of it. Because he, he was in a lot of pain, you mm-hmm. know, towards the end. Mm-hmm. And he would cry a lot, mm-hmm. you know. And I remember one night when he was in a hospital bed in the bedroom. And he was crying. And uh, I remember he was hooked up to a lot of things. And I remember I was afraid that I was going to hurt him, but I said, the hell with it. I climbed into his bed with him, and mm-hmm. I just held him, mm-hmm. you know. And um, like all night he was crying, you know. And... Part of me thinks he was crying because he knew he was dying, you know. And I think, yes, he missed my mother. You know, he never said, I miss your mother. But, of course, he did. He Mm -hmm. loved her very much. And after he died, I remember one day my sister and I asked my mother. (laughs) It was actually very funny because here we are, two grown-up women. We We asked my mother, Ma. When you wouldn't see Daddy when he was dying, is there a reason? Did we we ask our mother if she thought or knew that our father had cheated on her when they were married? And then we, after we asked the question, we said together, "We don't want to know." <laughs> <laughs> we did. We really did. We did. <laughs> okay, two grown women. You know, Ma. Did Daddy cheat on you or do something like that when you were married? And her answer was. No, he was a very good husband. <laughs> we were trying to figure out what the source was. What what was the problem here? Right, you know. Right. What do you think? Some of my friends think that she had that all Alzheimer's had just crept into that point. Right. When he was admitted to hospice, and when she found out, because I remember when they brought all the hospice equipment to the house, like the hospital bed and everything mm-hmm. else, she went crazy. Mm-hmm. She didn't like it, she said, because my mother was an interior designer when she was younger and mm-hmm. working. And it made their bedroom, which looked like an interior designer had done it, not my taste, but hers, 
It made it look, it look like a hospital room, and she hated mm-hmm. it, and she wanted she wanted the hospital bed gone. He needed it, and we had a horrible fight with her. It's staying. We told her it's staying. I think she just, she couldn't handle it. She mm-hmm. couldn't manage that what she thought was going to be her perfect life wasn't. No one's life is, you know. I think that was it, and I think that made part of me feel, and I, I actually do believe this, that everything is manageable. It mm-hmm. just is. You have to, you have you have two choices. You can either manage life or you can't give up. There's no point to that. And so what have you learned through this process? How did you take care of yourself? And what's your anchor to keep you sane through all of the caregiving that you've done in the past few years? I think my anchor with my mother, my anchor with my father was that I had a support team there all the time mm-hmm. that, you know, who explained because it's side, you mm-hmm. know, they, they know it's going to happen. With my mother, I think it's reading everything I can read about Alzheimer's and honestly, um, coming to the caring kind of events that I come to and talking to people here because mm-hmm. that's all you people do. You know, that's all you people do. And you, I mean, I know you, I believe your slogan is the heart of Alzheimer's caregiving Mm -hmm. is also the heart and soul of it. You know, I mean, you walk, literally, you walk into this, your offices, and the vibe is we care, and it's people, I don't think anyone's here because they couldn't find another job. I think, (laughs) seriously. (laughs) It's like me today doing this. I figure if one person hears what I have to say, and it helps them at all to know that you're not alone, there's no formula to any of this. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's not a disease that people can say, um, there's no direction to it. Mm-hmm. You can't cure it. Well, mm-hmm. right now you can't, you can't even treat it. After my father died, I just hated my mother. I hated her for what she did or what she didn't do for my father, you know. I hated her. And now, I mean, there have been times I don't really feel like this because I, I couldn't do it by myself, but there have been times when I thought if I could just, like, live with her, I can't because it takes so many people to take care of her. Right. But um, it's just different. It's completely different, you know. And also, I've told people, friends of mine, who on occasion will say, and how's your mother? Don't ask me how my mother is. I tell them that. I always say, a friend of mine once said, is she stable? And I said, she doesn't have the flu and she doesn't have, you know, she's not an ICU. I said, aside from brain disease, she's fine. So I think sarcasm helps here, you know? Because I, I don't like it if, if people say, how's your mother? How do you think she is? Yeah. That, con- that, that question makes me crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, or if sometimes a relative once in a while will call and say, uh, who hasn't seen my mother in say two years, will call and say, I was, how's your mother? I was thinking of visiting her. And I go, uh huh. You know, and then they say, um, do you think she'll recognize me? And I'll say, no. Oh, will you meet us? No. You know, two years, Alzheimer's, I haven't seen her. I'm feeling guilty. It's because someone told me that. Mm-hmm. One of your. I was at something, and I was talking to one of the social workers here, and, you know, she said, it's guilt. They feel all of a sudden, after two years, they start to feel guilty. Oh, I should maybe go see Ruthie, okay? And will you meet us there? No, I won't, you know, I won't. She's not going to know who you are, and if you try to explain it or she doesn't know what the word cousin means, forget it. Mm -hmm. Actually, sometimes I get a little nasty, and I don't hear from them again, which is the point. (laughs) I don't want to hear from you ever again, you know? We've got to wrap up, but if you were to meet a person who is just starting on their caregiving journey, what's the one piece of advice you would give them? It doesn't matter what this person ever said or did to you in your entire life. Show them unconditional love. Short and sweet. Ellen, thank you so much for coming in. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. I hope I helped someone. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to share your story, go to caringkindnyc.org slash podcast. Maybe we'll use your story on the show. We'd love to hear from you. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave some glowing feedback. We love positive reinforcement. I'm Chris Doucette, and you're listening to Caregiver Storyteller, produced by Karen Kind, the heart of Alzheimer's caregiving.